Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. You excited to be here? Yes. All right. Some of you need to tell your faces, but it's good to see you. Uh, I don't know. I'm kind of in a mood today. I don't, I'll just, um, and, it, and it doesn't matter. Hey, great to see you. Um, uh, exciting. Maybe, you know what it is a little bit? It's the humidity. Did it just, did it just sneak up and get you today? Whew. Let's just call it a blessing. What a blessing. <laughs> now, we're really good to see you. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, excited to share this word with you this morning. Before you do, though, I, I just really quickly uh, want to bring you a report. Um, I know uh, several weeks ago, uh, if you're aware, um, uh, myself and a few of our team took a trip down to Ecuador. And we went down there to, there's a church that we planted in Ecuador several years ago. Uh, and... I had actually never connected with them and wanted the opportunity to go down and see what was going on um, and see what's happening. And they'd gone through some trials, some leadership transition that they had walked through. Uh, and then as we discovered when we got down there, um, as much of an impact as we think that COVID had on our lives, it was increasingly difficult there. Um, and, and a lot of the things that they walked through were, um, as a part of that, they lost the facility that they were doing church in and, and had to navigate some leadership troubles and things like that. But I want to say this, Pastor Oscar and Cami uh, have done an incredible job of holding things together, uh, of creating a leadership team down there and really doing ministry. And, and so we were so glad to, to go down there and, and be able to make some leadership investment in them help give them some focus. And so I'll first just want to say thank you for uh, giving us the space to be able to go down and do that. But one of the, the things that we discovered while we were down there was they've got some space issues. Um, so because they lost the space that they were having church, they, they ended up uh, moving to this place in the city. And it's really a place where no one lives. Uh, it's kind of an industrial area of the city. Um, this is kind of just where they were, their hand was sort of forced to end up. Uh, and they ended up in this office complex where it's a five-story building, and they have two of the floors in the building where they're having church. You walk in on a main level, the, the, first, the, le the first level above that main level, the second floor there, uh, is where they have church. And then the fourth floor is where they have kids' ministry. There's an elevator that will maybe hold two people at a time. So I, I just want you to think, and, and parents, I, I know, I think I know how you would feel about this, but if we invited you into church and just said, yes, we have a place for your kids, just walk up five stories and drop them off there, it, it's, it's probably not something that you get real excited about. Uh, and so while we were there and watching sort of the leadership journey that they've been on, we started to really pray about God would ask us to do. And, and so um, we just really felt like we put it on our hearts and we made a decision this week that we're going to bless them financially and help them get into a place that will help them continue ministry. Uh, and we're excited about that. They're doing such good work there. And if they were in a better spot, there's so much more that they could do. They've got an after school program that they're doing. They're doing entrepreneurship programs for women in the city. They're, they're out um, feeding the homeless, doing a lot of really great things. And so we're just so proud of them. But I just want to say thank you to you. You're creating the margin and the space uh, if through your generosity and through your faithfulness that allows us to say yes to blessing them in this way. So, so thank you for all that you do. There, there are, are peoples whose names and whose faces you may not know this side of heaven, but you're having an impact on their lives. And so thank you for all that you do. We'll put the ways that you can give up on the screen. There's kiosks in the back of the room if you came prepared to give in person today, but just know your generosity, your faithfulness, and your tithes and in your offerings is making a difference in the lives of people. So thank you so much. All right. Are you ready to get in the word today? Yes. All right, let's do it. Don't let the humidity suck the life out of you today, all right? Let's take a biblical journey together. We're in week three of our series on Nehemiah. Uh, and in, in week one, we heard that Nehemiah had heard that the walls of Jerusalem were down. Now, this wouldn't have been news to him. They had been down for over 100 years. But when he hears the news this time, he feels a burden on his heart that's making him think, I, I need to do something about this. There's, God begins to speak to him about it. And so he goes into months of prayer and fasting, asking God what he would have him do about this burden that he felt. And 
He, but he's asking God, give me clarity. How do you want me to move forward? What, what does it look like uh, for me to, to be able to, to address this? Last week, we talked about how his faithfulness, Nehemiah's faithfulness to serve the king of Persia opened the door for him to be blessed to go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. His faithfulness to, to serve in the place where his feet stood opened the door for him to be blessed when he went. And so the king not only just lets him go to Jerusalem, but he sends him with a note saying that as he traveled, he couldn't be touched. He also gave him permission to go uh, and get lumber from the king's forest to help rebuild the walls and the gates and also to build a house for himself. And as we've sort of walked through the last couple of weeks, there's this progression that we see in Nehemiah's life that I think can sort of speak into this progression that we can often see in our lives. And it starts with us feeling a burden for something. And what our next step should be should sort of be this logical going to God and praying and asking God for clarity and direction, saying, God, what do you want me to do about this thing that I feel in my heart? All the while staying faithful to where God currently has us. And then we get to a place where we're released to go address what God has put in our hearts. And now, as we come into today, this is the place that we find Nehemiah as we continue on our journey. So he's begun the journey. He's, he's went out. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 9, when it says this, When I came to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, I delivered the king's letters to them. The king, I should add, had sent along army officers and horsemen to protect me. But when Sanballat, and Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of my arrival, they were very displeased that someone had come to help the people of Israel. I want you to see a couple of things in this passage. The first is that the king had not only just said, yes, I'll give you permission to go and let, yes, I'll let you use the resources. But as Nehemiah is leaving, he's saying, you know what? I don't want anything to happen to you. So I'm going to send uh, some horsemen. I'm going to send some uh, army officers. They're going to go with you just to send a signal that you need to be left alone. But the other thing that I want you to see is that immediately as he begins the journey, immediately as he steps into this land to do these things, he runs into these two guys. And I just want to be clear, they're going to be a problem. As we move into the story, um, the immediate, it's like he goes, I, I, I just get there, I'm just coming into town, and I run into these guys that are displeased that anyone would come to help Israel. And, and I just, I really think this is important for us to note. And I mean it in this way. When we're being obedient to God's plan, we experience opposition. And, and I want to be clear about this because, I, and maybe I just need to phrase it this way. There is a real enemy that doesn't want to see the plan of God succeed in our life. There is a real enemy that will come against you to try and prevent you from doing the thing that God is asking you to do in your life. He, he, he'll do it. He comes against you. And, and when we begin to walk in obedience and when we begin to walk in purpose that God is calling us to, trust me, opposition will find you. Look, in John 10, Jesus addresses this when he says that the thief's purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus says, my purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life, but the enemy's purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so we can just have it in our minds that when you begin to walk in obedience, there's going to be things that will oppose you doing the thing that God is asking you to do. You can bank on it. So our temptation, though, can be that when we encounter trouble and when we encounter problems, it makes us throw the brakes on our obedience. It makes us say, ooh, well, this is getting a little harder than I thought it was going to be. And so we stop. But I, I just have to say, we can't allow opposition to prevent us from moving forward. Opposition may slow us down, but we can't allow it to stop us. So what if we shifted our mindset from thinking of opposition as something that will prevent us from getting to where we're going, but instead look at opposition as an invitation to trust God more. Amen. Yes. Well, it's, it's getting quiet in here. I'm sorry. Am I? 
This is, this is, the, this is just the truth, because can, can I just tell you, sometimes for me, when I find myself up against things that are preventing me from fully stepping into all that God has for me, it makes me realize that I'm on the right track. And, and I know that it might sound funny, but I, here's what I can tell you. I know that the enemy doesn't want me to walk in the fullness of everything that God has for me. So opposition signals to me that I'm doing the right thing. I, I know it's not fun. I, can, can I tell you, and I know this sounds odd. Some of you are going to be like, that's weird, man. And, uh, but I, I can tell you this. I can tell you that there is consistently times where I get up if you don't believe me, you can ask Michelle. I get up on a Sunday morning, and I will have a, a random ailment that will just afflict my body. Yes. I have woken up on Sunday mornings with, like, gout where I can't stand. Just out of nowhere. I, I woke up on a Sunday morning with frozen shoulder. You, you, you probably didn't know. There was a Sunday, and I preached here, and I had my arm like this the whole time. Which, if you're here enough, you know that's a problem for me. <laughs> I've had stomach issues, headaches, and things. And, and can, so can I tell you, because here, here's what can happen. What I could do is get up in the morning and understand that these things are happening to me and just be frustrated and just go, oh, I can't do it. I can't make it. But instead, here's what I can tell you. I get up, and when I start to experience those things, I go, oh, shoot, God's got a word for the people today. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to tell you that opposition for us can often signal that we're doing the right thing. We just have to get to a place where you tell the enemy, I'm sorry, you don't get to win. I'll stay on track. I'll stay faithful. Verse 11, okay, I'm going to have to wake you up somehow today. <laughs> Verse 11, so I arrived in Jerusalem three days later, and I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me, and I hadn't told anyone about the plans that God had put on my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals with us except the donkey I was riding, and after dark, I went out through the valley gate, past the jackal's well, over to the dung gate, and inspect the broken walls and the burned gates. Then I went and found the fountain gate into the king's pool, but my donkey couldn't get through the rubble. So though it was still dark, I went up the Kidron Valley instead, inspecting the walls before I turned back and entered again at the valley gate. So he goes at night and assesses the, the damage. He looks at the walls. He gets an idea of the work that needs to get done. And, and I think this is important because I think that we need to be realistic about what we're getting into. Yes. We, we do this, and let me, let me model this for you. We do this when, we, when we're buying a house. Have you ever thought about buying a house? Have you ever bought a house before? You start to ask all the questions, right? How big is it? How many bedrooms are there? How many bathrooms are there? Where is it? What's my commute going to be? If you're a parent, you ask, like, what are the schools around here like? And we get all the way down, and then we, we love it. And then we ask, what's this going to cost? <laughs> right? We, we count the cost of what it's going to be to step into this thing that we're seeing. And, and, it, and it looks nice. It looks like something that we'd want. This could be this calling on our life that we feel like God is calling. I feel purpose in that. I feel that God is calling me to that. But the, the truth is, is that it's going to cost you something. Jesus talked about this in Luke chapter 14, where he said, and if, you do not carry, and if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Verse 28, but don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. Look, I told you in week one of this series that nothing compares to the joy of being obedient to doing what God is asking you to do. I, let me say that again, because I, I won't want this to sink into you. Nothing compares to the joy of being obedient to what God is asking you to do. 
But the truth is, to step into something new that God is calling you to, it's going to cost you some of what you've got today. Your schedule may change. You may need to look at what you're prioritizing. It may cause you to sacrifice something in your life. But you have to remember that it's for your good and it's for the good of the kingdom of God. Now, now here's what I, I want you to see because this is where I think that we don't understand because we feel this burden in our life and we know that we can find purpose in something and we can even say, God, I feel like you're calling me into something new, but I don't want anything in my life to change. God, God, I feel like you might be doing something in me that's calling me into a new season, but I'd sure like it if my schedule can stay the same. And I, I'd sure like it if, if the landscape of my life can be looking, I want to just, I want to be everything to be the same. Don't disrupt my life, but please take me into something new. <laughs> Do you see the tension in that? And what I'm saying is, is that God's plans for your life are good. His purposes that he's calling you into are good. The thing that he's calling you into in your life, it's for your good, but it's going to cost you something. And so what Nehemiah is even doing here in the night, he's going to count the cost. He's saying, what's it going to take to get this done? What's the demand going to be for this to happen? But if if God is calling you to something, if God is laying something in your heart, remember that his plans are good. And even if it costs you to sacrifice, in the end, it's for your good. Yes. Nehemiah understood this. You are quiet. Am I challenging you too much today? <laughs> Look, I'm just saying, like, I get it. Because, because here's the thing, right? I come up, well, here's what I'm supposed to do. Everything's going to be great. You're going to feel good all the time. And it's just, have you ever had a season in life where everything felt great all the time? I'm not going to lie to you. What, here's what I'm trying to say. God's got plans for you. Yes. God's got purpose for you. Yes. God's, God's got something for your life. He's calling you to something greater that's outside of you. But trust me, when you step into it, the, the enemy does not want you to succeed. And trust me, when you step into it, there's going to be opposition. And trust me, it's going to cost you something. But nothing compares to the joy of being obedient to what God is asking you to do. Yeah. Yeah. Nehemiah understands all of this. And so he gets to the next verse and he starts to lay out the plan. Verse 16, the city officials didn't know that I had been out there or what I, I've been doing what I had been doing. For I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. He went out without them knowing to assess the damage. He hadn't spoke to any of the leadership that had been living in Jerusalem about the plans that he had or why he was there. But why? Because how often have you felt like you've had something on your heart and when you share it with somebody, they find a way to tell you what a bad idea it is. Yeah. Or maybe they get you to focus on how hard it's going to be. Yep. Or, or maybe all they get you to talk about is how much it's going to cost you. Look, it is very easy in your life to find naysayers. People are ready and willing to let you know how you're going to fail. People are constantly operating out of the insecurity that they have in their own life to pull you down on what God's dreaming you, making your heart dream about. Can I, can I give you one of the deepest spiritual principles that I can give you in your life? Haters going to hate. They are quick and willing to tell you how you're going to fail. And God is giving you the faith to accomplish the thing that he has on your life. Let me phrase it this way. God is giving you the faith 
to accomplish the thing that he has on your life. He's not giving that faith to anybody else. And if we get to a place where we're looking for the validation or the opinions of other people, or we're looking for them to affirm us, then we can miss what God is trying to say to us. So when God is speaking, we have to understand that God's voice has to be the loudest in our lives. And the only way that we get to that place is that we have to continue to pray. And listen, we can't just pray about whether or not we should do the thing. We've got to continually be in prayer, asking God to be with us all the way through the process, asking for God's wisdom and insight all along the way, bringing people in when the time is right. But every step requires connection to God. Isn't that the place that you want to be where your decisions are being met with the wisdom of God? See, Nehemiah was a cupbearer. He wasn't a contractor. But God knew that he had strategically positioned him for this moment. But Nehemiah needed a skill set that was over his head. But if Nehemiah had said, I got this bird and God, I'm just going to go in. And he didn't invite God on the journey. He'd still be over his head, but without the wisdom of God in his life. Can I tell you a prayer? Can I have a moment of transparency with you? Let me tell you a prayer that I pray often. God, make me smarter than I am and give me more wisdom than I've got. It's this admission that, that I need him to speak into my life. That I'm only so capable and he is infinitely capable. So I need him in my life. Okay, okay. I'm, I, listen, I can tell in the room, I've already scared you today. So let me, uh, <laughs> let me freak you out a little bit more. God won't call you to things that you can handle. Oh, no, you didn't hear me. God won't call you to things that you can handle. He will call you to things that will, will require more than you've got. God will call you to things that you need him for if you're going to succeed. God calls you to things that you've got to say, I don't know how this is going to happen, so I need you to come with me. If God called you to things that you could do, you wouldn't need him. So God calls you to things that are outside of your scope, that are more than you can handle, that are beyond what you can carry. And he says, would you take me with you? And let me tell you today, you will accomplish more, do bigger things, see greater things in your life. If you'll say, God, I'll be obedient to do, I don't know how I'm going to do it. And it scares me to death. But if you're calling me to do it, then come with me because I need your help. And what you'll see is the doors will open. God will begin to work in your way in ways that you can't possibly understand. And at the right time, he'll bring people along your side. At the right time, he'll give you the resources. But it needs you running back to him again and again and saying, God, if I could do it on your own, I wouldn't need you, but my plans include you. Yes. Once Nehemiah has inspected everything and he understands what it's going to take, he loops in the leadership of Jerusalem. Verse 17, but now I said to them, you know very well the trouble that we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. So let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. And they replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. At the right time, he invites them into the conversation. When God spoke to him and told him, all right, are you ready? I'm getting ready to unleash this thing in your life. At the right time, he invites them in, and when they hear it, they get fired up. Yes, let's do it. Let's rebuild the wall. Look, that wall had been crumbled for over 100 years, and now everyone's like, let's build a wall. <laughs> They're excited about it. But of course, as soon as they decide to do it, verse 19, but when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab heard of our plans, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king, they asked. Nehemiah, verse 20, I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding the wall, but you have no share, legal right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. Yes. Nehemiah takes this stand. Look, name it what you want to. The king, the task, it doesn't matter but because I won't be discouraged because God asked me to do this. 
Like, I, I don't care what it is that you have to say. I don't care what kind of discourage you're trying to bring out. I don't care what kind of distraction you're trying to be because I know that God asked me to do this. So here's the place that we can have, have the assurance if we're being obedient that God is on our side. In Romans 8, the apostle Paul says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? So we've got to stand our ground and say, nothing will move me. Nothing will persuade me. Nothing will distract me. If God has given me something to do, I will be obedient to what he's calling me to do. So say what you're going to say. Do what you're going to do. Act how you're going to act. But nothing will persuade me to disobedience. Nothing will move me off the task that God has called me to. Because you don't understand that he's with me. So good luck trying to stop me. I know God's on my side. I know that he's calling me to this. And I know that he's with me. So we're going to do the thing that he's asking us to do. In Nehemiah chapter 3, they start to build the wall. And I want to show you a little bit of of Nehemiah chapter 3. Let me just start in verse 1 where it says this. Then Eliashib, the high priest... And the other priests start rebuilding the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set up its doors, building the wall as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated in the Tower of Hananel. Verse 2, people from the town of Jericho worked next to them, and beyond them was Zechur, son of Emery. Verse 3, the fish gate was built by the sons of Hassanah. They laid the beams, they set up the doors, they installed its bolts and bars. Verse 4, Merimoth, son of Uriah and grandson of Hakaz, repaired the next section of the wall. Beside him were Meshullam, son of Berechiah, and the grandson of Meshezabel, and then Zadok, son of Banah. Verse 5, next were the people of Tekoa, though their leaders refused to work with the construction supervisors. Verse 6, the old city gate was repaired by Joiada, son of Paseah, and Meshullam, son of Besodeah. They laid the beams, set up the doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Verse 7, next to them were Melatiah from Gibeon, Jadon from Maranoth, people from Gibeon and people from Mizpah, the headquarters of the governor of the province west of the Euphrates River. That's verse 1 through 7. If you read all the way through chapter 3 of Nehemiah, what you'll find is that it outlines every group of people and the section of the wall or the gate that they worked on. It's, it's the entire thing of chapter 3 of Nehemiah. And I read you a section of it so that you can get an idea of it. I'd read on, but I could see that your eyes were glazing over already. <laughs> but here, here's the thing that I really felt like the Lord told me to do to conclude this today, because I'm talking about God giving a burden for somebody and giving you purpose in it. And I'm, I'm talking uh, about how God will uh, give you a new season for you to step into. I'm talking really about God, that God has a purpose for you that's outside of you, that he wants to partner with you and he wants to take you into a day that you can't imagine for your life. But here is the sense that I have in my heart right now, and as I was studying for this week, that a lot of us hear that, And they go, that's a really good word for somebody. But God doesn't have a purpose for me. That's a really good word for somebody, but God doesn't have a place for me. I I think it's awesome that that somebody might be called to do something for the kingdom. but, But I don't think that it's me. But here's what I want you to see. What I want you to see is that when the work started, that at every place along the wall, at every spot that there was to do work, at every section, at every inch, at every gate, at every stone, at every plank of wood, it required somebody to stand in that spot. Here's what I want you to hear. There was a big kingdom purpose, and that was to build a wall but it required somebody to stand at every place in that wall and to do the work. So 
So here's what I want you to hear today. It's not purpose for somebody. It's not purpose for someone. But in the kingdom, God's got a purpose for everybody. He's got a spot for you to stand. He's got something for you to do. He's got something that he's asking you to step into. His purposes are for his kingdom to be expanded. And he's calling you into partnership with him to do the thing that he's placed on your life. And I believe that the call today is for you to find your place. It's for you to step into your spot. Because here's the truth. I think the truth in our life is that we can feel that tug in our heart, that God's asking us to do something. The truth is, is that we can feel that the Holy Spirit is doing something in our hearts that's saying, he's calling me into something greater. He's asking me to minister. And it could just look like he's asking you to minister to your neighbor. It could just look like he's asking you to be a Christian in your workplace. It could just be that he's, he's calling you in the, in the place that you find community with, with where your kids go to school, that he's asking you to be a light. But God's calling us to something. And I think that we sense the burden on our heart and then we push it to the side because we say, God, you can't mean me. Here's what I'm telling you today. He means you. If he placed the burden on your life, he means you. And so church, I'm challenging you today. You have a part to play. For some of us, that's serving here in the church. Like every time we've brought up serving in kids' ministry, there's been a stirring in your heart, but you, you just keep ignoring it. Or maybe it's serving with our youth, or maybe it's serving in some other capacity here on a Sunday morning. Maybe it's serving in the outreach ministries, or maybe it's outside the walls of the church. Maybe really in your workplace, there, there's been somebody that you know that you're supposed to be talked to and you just keep ignoring it because you keep saying, God, you can't mean me. I can tell you that I believe that God is asking us to step into the place that he's calling us to. That God's asking us to be obedient. Maybe today it's on this Sunday on our Connect Sunday, where there's been something in your heart that's been saying, look, I'm lonely. I, I don't have people that surround me. I'm, I'm trying to, to walk out this faith, but I don't, I don't have anybody in my life to do this with. I, I'm just telling you, today's a day that you can find your place. For somebody to encourage you, for, to have community with somebody, to help build each other up, what, what I'm challenging you with today is don't be content to just have the burden. Step into your place. And, and look, I, I know I haven't made it. I, I'm intentional today. I'm not trying to make it sound glamorous. You're going to find opposition. There will be difficulty. It's going to cost you something. But nothing compares to the joy of being obedient to what God is asking you to do. And when you step into that place and you invite him on the journey with you, can I just tell you the landscape of your life changes? You find joy where you never thought you would. You find purpose in a way that you never thought that you could. When we start to be obedient and say, God, if you're placing this on my life, I'll do the thing that you're asking me to do. I'll count the cost. I know that there's going to be opposition, but I invite you on the journey with me. So can I just challenge you today? Find your place. Like the people building the walls of Jerusalem, there is a place for you. Can I pray that way today? Father, this is my prayer. God, that we would stop ignoring the things that you're stirring on our hearts. That we'd, we'd no longer be content to just feel the whisper of the Holy Spirit in our life and then dismiss it. But that today would be a day that when you're laying the burdens on our heart, when you're stirring something in our heart in obedience, we would take a step to go into our place, to serve the purpose that you have for our life. God, we recognize it's bigger than us. We recognize that it won't be easy, but God, could we have a willingness and a strength to be obedient to what you're calling us to? And could we trust you in every step along the way? Could we believe with you for the things that you're calling us to, God? And then, God, could we see your hand at work? 
So Lord, we thank you that you have a place for us. And in obedience today, we step into our place. Use us, Lord. Use us for your purposes. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to give space today to allow the Holy Spirit to just continue to work on your heart. Can, can I tell you how I'm going to pray today for you as your pastor? That God would put a burden on your heart that you cannot ignore. And that we would take bold steps today to say, I won't be content to just feel the burden. I'm going to do something about it. Step into your place today. Have a conversation today. Make the phone call today. Say yes today. Sign up for a group today. Get serving today. But don't ignore the burden that God has placed on your life. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to ask our prayer teams to come forward and to be available. And maybe you would say, hey, look, there's something that's been stirring on my heart. I need someone to partner with me in prayer. These people are willing to pray with you. Maybe you need healing, something that's happening in your life. But, but please use this as an opportunity to allow these people to partner with you in prayer. And let the Holy Spirit work in your heart. I'll come back in a moment and close with the blessing. But you, what, would you right now allow the Holy Spirit to work in your heart? prayer today is that God would be speaking to our hearts to say 
God, I, I just won't ignore this thing that you're placing on my heart. And with boldness, I'll step into the place that you're calling me to do the thing that you're asking me to do. Because nothing compares to the joy of being obedient to what God is asking you to do. So trust him and take that step. Find your place. So can I encourage you today? Have a conversation with somebody. Take a, don't, don't let today pass without taking a step. If that means that you need to sign up for a group, go out and find one. Find your place. If that means that you need to step into serving, go find your place. If that means somebody that you know that you're supposed to be ministering to in your life, make the call, make the text, find your place. Do what God is asking you to do. It won't be easy, but it's worth it. So can we trust the Lord today? Can we trust the Lord today? Yes. Good. All right. Do you still love me? Yes. All right. Okay. It's getting a little iffy there in the middle. All right. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Let me just say, as a church, our commitment to you is to help you walk out the purposes that God has for your life. Okay. Can I just tell you what the job of the church is? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Yes. It's not our job just to do the ministry and for you to receive it. Listen, Christianity is not a spectator sport. You don't sit on the sidelines and watch it. Our job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Our commitment to you is to walk alongside you to help you walk out the purposes for your life. Give us a chance to do that. All right? <clears throat> Thank you so much for being here this morning. I really encourage you have a conversation in the lobby before you go today. Take a step for the thing that you're supposed to work on. I'll dismiss with the blessing. Put the ways that you can give up on the screen. Kiosks are in the back of the room, but if you would, posture yourself to receive the blessing today. So Father, would you bless them and keep them? Would you make your face shine down upon them? Would you be gracious to them? Turn your countenance their direction and give them peace. In the almighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We love you. We believe in you and we'll fight for you. Have an incredible day.